Materials used in this presentation are period in nature and used for educational and entertainment purposes. Furthermore, videos have been used in conjunction with the photographs to produce continuity, in some instances are composites, and fall within the purview of the fair use doctrine of U.S. copyright laws. Attributions are given when required. Welcome to the True Crime Man's Dark Imagination YouTube channel, your source for interesting and factual crime. Please like, share, subscribe, and hit the bell so you can stay up to date on any future programs. In the early 1960s, a man and a woman met while working at the same place of employment and later learned that they shared a fantasy. That fantasy was to commit murder for the thrill of pleasing a morbid interest in death and destruction. By the end of their spree, so to speak, these two sadistic individuals ruined the lives of many families in exercising their most despicable and heinous desires. On October 2nd, 1965, Police Superintendent Bob Talbot of the Staley Bridge Police received a call from one of his detectives to appear at the Hyde Police Station and that the matter appeared very urgent. 17-year-old David Smith and his young wife, Maureen, sat in the Hyde Police Station waiting to speak to a ranked member of the force for the story he had to tell demonstrated such extraordinary facts that the local police constabulary would take a great interest in what Smith had to say. When Superintendent Talbot arrived at the station, a constable led him to the inquiry room where the young couple sat drinking tea. Smith related that the night before, his sister-in-law, Myra, visited his home and stated she was afraid to walk home alone and asked Smith to accompany her to her residence. When the two arrived at Myra's residence in Manchester, Myra invited her brother-in-law into the house, saying that her boyfriend, Ian, had some wine samples for the youth. After entering the residence, Myra left Smith in the kitchen. According to his statement to Superintendent Talbot, Smith heard silence throughout the house and found himself startled by a loud scream coming from the living room. Myra yelled for Smith to come into the living room. Startled by Myra's scream, Smith moved to the living room and witnessed Myra's boyfriend, Ian, holding what appeared to be a large doll in his arms. Ian dropped the bundle he held in his arms, and when it fell against the couch, Smith saw what he believed to be a young man who groaned incessantly. Smith also witnessed Ian holding an axe, and when the body fell to the floor, Ian smashed the axe into the young man's head. The young man continued to groan. Ian struck the man a second time and his groaning stopped. The only sound that Smith could hear was the gurgling blood in the victim's throat. Smith then related that Ian placed a cover over the young man's head and wrapped some electrical wire around his neck. Ian pulled on the wire. Each time he gained his composure, he pulled the wire tighter and tighter. Smith stated he repeated, quote, you f***ing bastard, end quote, over and over again until the man finally stopped breathing. Ian then looked toward Myra and said, quote, that's the messiest one yet, end quote. After Ian made sure the young man had finally succumbed, he, Myra, and Smith went into the kitchen where she made them all tea. While sitting at the table in a state of shock, Smith claimed that Myra and Ian laughed as they reviewed Ian's kill for the evening and hearkened back to a previous murder they allegedly committed together. In one particular instance, a police officer supposedly confronted Myra as the two buried one of their alleged victims on the Saddleworth Moor. Smith then became scared and feared for his safety, not knowing whether the two pulled a sick joke on him while he was there at the house. Smith believed that he could convince Myra and Ian that he was their accomplice. Then, they may not kill him. He helped clean up the mess in the living room, tied up the body, then helped Ian carry it to the upstairs bedroom. Smith stated that he would return in the morning as the hour was late and help them dispose of the body. When Smith returned home, he became physically ill and vomited. After he related the story of the previous night's events to his wife, Maureen, together the young couple went to the public phone box 
and called the police. Who was this murderous couple? Police learned that Myra Henley and Ian Brady may have been responsible for a series of missing children in the Manchester area, but wanted to know more of this duo that would later be described as, quote, two sadistic killers of the utmost depravity, end quote. Myra Henley was born on July 23, 1942, and raised in Gorton, a working-class area of Manchester. Frequently beaten by her alcoholic father and ignored by her enabling mother, Myra and the Henley family resided in a house so small that she slept in a single bed in the same bedroom as her parents, who slept in a double bed. When Myra's sister, Maureen, was born in 1946, the living arrangements became almost unbearable and her parents sent her to live with her grandmother when she turned five. Myra's father was a veteran of World War II who fought in the bloody campaigns of North Africa, Cyprus, and Italy, and expected his children to be just as tough as he. Described as a hard man, one day when Myra was eight, a young boy met her outside her house and scratched her on both cheeks, drawing blood. When the distraught Myra returned home in tears, her father met her at the door and threatened to whip her if she didn't go back and punch the boy who caused her to cry. Myra left the house, found the boy, and through a series of punches, accomplished what she described as, quote, my first victory, end quote. Later evaluations by criminologists determined that this incident demonstrated the brutalization that Myra suffered at the hands of her father and could have contributed to her subsequent murderous behavior. It seemed that Myra suffered nothing but hardship and tragedy within her early life. One of her best friends, Michael Higgins, drowned in an abandoned reservoir. Myra passed up the opportunity to go with her dear friend, but chose instead to go out with another young friend. Myra blamed herself for the tragedy because she was known as a good swimmer, and had she been there with Higgins, he may not have perished. After Higgins' funeral, Myra became heavily involved into the Catholic Church and even took communion in November 1958, much against the wishes of her mother. Also at this time, Myra began dyeing her hair blonde and then started her first job as a junior clerk at a local electrical engineering firm. Well-liked and considered an exemplary employee, once when she lost her pay envelope, the other girls in the office started a collection within the firm and replaced the money she lost. Myra also had a love interest at this time, a gentleman named Ronnie Sinclair. Although the two were engaged for a time, Myra broke off the engagement, citing Sinclair's immaturity as the main reason. Myra also began to take judo lessons at a local school, but found partners to work out with sparse as she took the practices too seriously and would not release her grip, hurting her partners. Myra then went to work at Mill Ward's Chemical Distribution Company, and while working there, she met a young man named Ian Brady. She soon became infatuated with the ne'er-do-well petty criminal. She thought the attraction so strong that she began to keep a diary, and although she dated several men, Myra's entries smattered of her longing for Brady. In December of 1961, the 22nd to be exact, Myra accepted an invitation from Brady to go to the cinema to see a movie regarding the Nuremberg trials of Nazi war criminals. The couple continued to see each other and followed a routine on their dates. First, a movie, generally of the X-rated variety. Then the two would go to Myra's residence and drink German wine. They spent their lunch breaks reading from stories of Nazi atrocities. The event so influenced Myra that she began to emulate the Aryan supremacy by continuing to bleach her hair and wear bright red lipstick. This man who exhibited influence over this young, impressionable girl, Ian Brady, was born in Glasgow, Scotland on January 2, 1938, to an unwed mother named Maggie Stewart, who worked as a tea room waitress. Because Brady's father was an uncertainty to Stewart, he never met the man. Furthermore, because her salary was not enough to take care of her and a young child, Stewart was forced to hand over her young son to a local family with four children of their own. Although he lived with another family, Brady's mother still visited him on occasion, but did not know that her young son loved to torture animals in his unstable youth. Brady broke the hind legs of one dog, burned another canine, and cut the head from a neighborhood cat. Throughout his youth, 
Brady had many brushes with the law. Accepted to an academy for above average pupils, Brady terrorized children much smaller than himself. The academy expelled the youngster, and Brady then went to work at Harland and Wolf's shipyard as a tea boy. His first girlfriend broke up with him at this time when he threatened her with a knife because she went to a dance with another boy. Brady then had another job where he worked as a butcher's messenger. Police then arrested Brady on burglary twice. Subsequently, Brady appeared in juvenile court on nine serious charges, never really specified, but the court sentenced the young man to probation on the condition that he lived with his mother who, by this time, married an Irish fruit merchant by the name of Pat Brady. Ian's stepfather got him a job as a fruit porter at the Smithfield Market. Within 12 months of living with his mother, Brady tried to smuggle some goods from the market and police arrested him again. Being as he had not reached his 18th birthday, the court sentenced him to a reform school at Hatfield. But after getting drunk on homemade alcohol, authorities transferred Brady to the tougher unit at Hull. On November 14, 1957, Brady returned to Manchester where he found a series of jobs that he eventually quit. Finally, he announced to his family that he wanted to improve himself and began studying books from the local library on bookkeeping. Brady spent hours in his room where he studied anything he could find related to the study of bookkeeping. In early 1959, Brady applied for a clerical job at Millwards and was hired. After his co-workers met the young man, they remembered him as quiet, always on time for the job, but very short-tempered. What they did notice was the reading material that Brady digested during his breaks and at lunch, books on Nazi atrocities and how to teach yourself German. Little did either Brady or Hindley know that their lives would take a heinous turn. As Hindley and Brady shared their waking moments together, they began to ostracize their co-workers and their families for the sake of each other's company. Hindley changed her appearance even further than her trademark blonde hair. She wore high mini skirts, high-heeled boots, and leather jackets now became parts of her everyday wardrobe. Hindley and Brady also took a keen interest in guns and photography. The couple also took photographs of each other in very suggestive and sometimes explicit positions. In 1963, the couple began conversing about committing, quote, the perfect murder, end quote. Brady read the book Compulsion, a fictionalized account of the Leopold and Loeb murder of 14-year-old Bobby Frank. The two rich kids believed themselves above the law and would not face justice, but they made some mistakes on their way to the perfect crime. Instead of the death penalty, their attorney, the incomparable Clarence Darrow, successfully argued for the duo to be sentenced to life in prison so that their minds would be studied to determine their motives for committing the crime. Despite the outcome of the Leopold Loeb case, Brady believed he and Henley would pull it off, or pull them off. In 1963, Brady moved in with Henley at her grandmother's house in Bannock Street. At this time, the two plotted to perfect their plan. Their first victim happened to be a friend of Henley's younger sister, Maureen. Pauline Reed, 16 years old, wanted to go to a dance at the Railway Workers Social Club on the night she disappeared. Reed planned to attend the dance with three of her friends, but when the parents of her friends learned that alcohol would be served at the soiree, they rescinded their permission and the three friends did not attend the dance. Reed went to the dance alone that evening. At approximately 8 o'clock on the evening of July 12, 1963, Reed adorned a pretty pink dress and left her home. Two of the friends, who were unable to attend because of their parents' restrictions, saw Reed leave her home and decided to follow her to the dance to really see if she would attend the event by herself. The two friends followed Reed for some distance and then decided to take a shortcut where they would meet her at the dance. The two friends arrived at the Railway Workers Social Club and waited for over an hour until Reed arrived, but she never showed up at the dance. At approximately midnight of the 12th, Reed's parents became worried when their daughter failed to return from the dance. Joan and Amos Reed, Pauline's parents, decided to go out into the night and look for her themselves, but to no avail. The next morning, they called the police. It seemed that Pauline Reed just vanished. On November 11, 1963, 
John Kilbride, 12 years old, went to the movies with a friend, John Ryan, also 12, in the afternoon of that day. The film finished at approximately 5 o'clock and Kilbride and Ryan went to the local market in Ashton under Lynn to see if they could earn some money helping the local merchants clean and close their stalls for the day. Ryan later stated that he remembered leaving Kilbride near the carpet dealer's stall so that he could catch his bus home. This was the last time anyone saw Kilbride. When Kilbride failed to return home, his parents, Sheila and Patrick Kilbride, called the local police for the second time in a very short period of time. A search began on the moors surrounding Manchester with police and thousands of volunteers looking to find the young boy. Their search produced no results whatsoever. On Tuesday, June 16, 1964, Keith Bennett, 12 years old, looked forward to going to his grandmother's house and spending the night as he did every Tuesday evening. In the evening when Keith's mother was to deliver him to his grandmother's house, as became the routine, Keith and his mother walked out of the door of their residence, and Mrs. Bennett watched her son walk over a road crossing and then onto Stockport Road. Mrs. Bennett then turned around and headed to the local bingo game, never worrying that her mother would take care of her son. Keith Bennett never arrived at his grandmother's house, but Mrs. Bennett did not discover that her son was missing until the next morning, when her mother, Winnie, arrived at the Bennett household without the company of little Keith. Immediately, Mrs. Bennett called the local police to report her son missing. Again, a massive search began in the moors near the Bennett residence for Keith Bennett, and again, Keith would not be found either. Six months passed since Keith Bennett's disappearance. Then, on December 26, 1964, 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey disappeared. Leslie and her two brothers attended a fair only minutes away from their home. Having spent their money and suffering from boredom, Leslie's friends left, but she remained at the fair. The last time anyone saw Leslie, she stood next to one of the rides at the fair. When she failed to return home, her mother and stepfather frantically searched for Leslie Ann. They called the police and, virtually by habit by now, organized another search of the countryside for their child. They found no trace of her. After David Smith related what happened at the Henley residence the night before, the police, obviously disturbed by what Smith related, went to the house Smith described in order to investigate. When Superintendent Talbot dressed in a bread delivery man's uniform, he went to the back door of Henley's residence. When Henley answered the door, Superintendent Talbot asked Henley if her husband was at home. Henley denied that she was married and asked Henley if he could take a look around the house. Talbot found Grady in the living room writing a note to his employer about an injury that occurred the night before. Superintendent Talbot explained to Brady in front of Henley that he was investigating a series of reports of shots being fired in the area the night before and with a couple mind if he took a look around. Joined by a Detective Sergeant Carr, the two began to search the residence. When the two policemen asked Henley for the key to the locked bedroom upstairs, she stated that she often worked in the room. Finally, Brady instructed Henley to hand over the key to the inquisitive lawmen. When they returned to the living room, Superintendent Talbot and Detective Sergeant Carr arrested Brady under suspicion of murder. Brady stated when the police officers arrested him that, quote, Eddie Evans and I had a row and the situation got out of hand, end quote. Although police only arrested Brady, Henley demanded that she go to the police station with the officers and Brady, bringing her small dog, Puppet, with them. When the police asked her to make a statement, Henley would go no further than to say that Evans's death was an accident. Authorities allowed Henley to return home with the promise that she would return the following morning. Over the subsequent days, Henley went to her employer and asked that she be dismissed so that she may collect unemployment benefits. Henley also tried to destroy any evidence of what the couple had been talking about over the last few years, including but not limited to robbing banks and the worst thing of all, planning the perfect murder. On October 11, 1965, police arrested Myra Henley as an accessory to the murder of Edward Evans. When police searched the Henley residence where the two had been living, they discovered a quote, exercise book, end quote, with the name of John Kilbride written on the front cover. 
Police then suspected that the couple were involved with the disappearances of children that occurred over the previous two years and that Hindley's role was much more than just an accomplice. Brady later told police that he and Smith murdered Evans and Hindley merely followed her lover's instructions. Smith stated to police that Brady demanded that Smith pack suitcases with evidence of Brady and Hindley's complicity in the disappearances. In one of the suitcases later discovered at a local train station, authorities located costumes, notes, photographs, and negatives, with some of the photos being that of Leslie Ann Downey, naked and a scarf tied across her mouth, and an audio tape of a girl screaming and pleading for her life. Leslie Ann Downey's mother later identified the desperate girl's voice on the recording as that of her daughter. When police inquired into the happenings at the Henley residence, they came across a 12-year-old boy named Pat Hodges, who inadvertently accompanied Brady and Henley to their many trips to the Saddleworth Moor. Hodges was able to identify several of the sites where the couple took him. Now armed with this new knowledge, police set out to search the moor for clues to where the other children may be. On October 16, 1965, Searchers located an arm bone that they mistakenly identified as belonging to John Kilbride. A few days later, Leslie Ann Downey's mother identified the bone as that belonging to her daughter along with the clothing that police found in the shallow grave. Authorities also located photographs in the aforementioned suitcase that depicted various areas of the Saddleworth Moor. Police asked the local community to identify these areas as Brady and Henley may have buried the bodies of young children there. Smith related to authorities that Brady kept, quote, photographic evidence, end quote, of multiple murders. On October 21, 1965, authorities discovered the badly decomposed body of John Kilbride, whom his mother identified by the clothing that he wore. On the same day that law enforcement discovered Kilbride's remains, Brady and Henley appeared at Hyde's Magistrate Court charged with the murder of Leslie Ann Downey. Jailers brought the couple to the court to answer the charges separately and then remanded to the jail without bail. They again appeared before the court for a brief two-minute proceeding then returned to their cells to await trial. Police believed that Brady and Henley, responsible for the other missing children, but with winter setting in, the search was suspended until such time when they could resume. In a subsequent interrogation, Brady admitted that he took photographs of Leslie Ann Downey, but that two men brought the young girl to his residence where the photographs were taken, but then left with the young girl still alive. By December 2, 1965, Brady would face trial for the murders of Evans, Kilbride, and Downey. Henley would face charges in the murders of Evans and Downey, as well as harboring Brady, her knowing that he murdered Kilbride. Authorities used a unique process to identify a timeline with the photographs Brady and Henley took. Most of the photographs included Henley's dog, Puppet, sometimes as a puppy and sometimes full grown. In order to determine this timeline, authorities enlisted a veterinarian to examine the animal for his exact age. The procedure required that the dog be anesthetized. Puppet did not survive the procedure and Henley expressed fury at the police for killing her puppy. This was the first demonstration of any emotion that the accused murderer Henley exhibited. In a letter to her mother, Henley stated, I feel as though my heart's been torn to pieces. I don't think anything could hurt me more than this has. After preliminary proceedings occurred before the three magistrates in Hyde, Brady and Henley's trial began before Mr. Justice Fenton Atkinson on April 19, 1966 at the Chester Assizes. Sir Elwyn Jones led the prosecution. Brady was defended by a Liberal Member of Parliament, Emmelyn Hooson, Queen's Counsel, and Henley was defended by Godfrey Heilpern, Queen's Counsel, Recorder of Salford. All of the attorneys within this case were vastly experienced in criminal prosecutions. The chief prosecution witness, David Smith, fielded offers from various media outlets for his story. Smith accepted one of the offers, and the association with the press outlets caused great consternation with the court. Opposing counsels repeatedly questioned both Smith and his wife, Maureen, about the agreement, believing this would have an effect on Smith's testimony to the court. However, Smith's testimony matched the statements he made to the police prior to coming to some agreement with the newspaper concern, 
without any embellishment whatsoever. So, the issue of Smith selling his story faded away. Brady and Henley both pled not guilty. Brady testified for over eight hours and Henley for six. Brady admitted he struck Evans with an axe, but someone else murdered the defendant's former friend when referencing the pathologist's report that Evans' death had been, quote, accelerated by strangulation, end quote. Brady's attitude in front of the jury smattered with, quote, undisguised arrogance and pedantry, end quote. When Henley testified, she stated that none of the photographs taken that the authorities seized were ever taken near any of the grave sites. The audio tape that authorities seized with the voice of Leslie Ann Downey was played in open court. Also, on the recording could be heard the voices of Brady and Henley. Henley admitted in her testimony that she treated Downey in a, quote, brusque and cruel manner, end quote, only because Downey demonstrated a lot of fear and made a lot of noise. Henley claimed to disengagement while Downey undressed, the photos were taken, and eventually Brady murdered the child. On May 6, 1966, the jury in the case against Ian Brady deliberated for a little over two hours and found the defendant guilty of all three murders, and Henley guilty in the murders of Downey and Evans. While Brady and Henley awaited their trial, Great Britain abolished the death penalty, and so the court sentenced both of them to life imprisonment. The court sentenced Brady to three concurrent life sentences, and Henley received two concurrent life sentences, with an additional seven years for harboring Brady for the Kilbride murder. At the close of the proceedings, prosecutors stated that the murders Brady and Henley committed were, quote, truly horrible, end quote, and characterized the two convicted defendants as, quote, two sadistic killers of the utmost depravity, end quote. Nineteen years after their initial conviction, newspapers still continued to connect Brady and Henley with other disappearances that occurred during the time of the original disappearances. Brady stated in an interview that he murdered Bennett and Reed, something that the police believed all along, and Bennett and Reed disappeared at about the same time as Kilbride and Downey. After this admission, the Greater Manchester Police reopened the investigation under the command of Detective Chief Superintendent Peter Topping, head of the department's Criminal Investigation Department. When the superintendent went to the prison where Brady resided, the convicted murderer denied committing any further murders. In November of 1986, Keith Bennett's mother wrote an impassioned letter to Henley where she hoped that the convicted murderer would tell her where the sadistic killers buried her son. Winnie Johnson, Keith Bennett's mother, concluded her letter, I am a simple woman. I work in the kitchens of Christie's Hospital. It has taken me five weeks of labor to write this letter because it is so important to me that it is understood by you for what it is, a plea for help. Please, Miss Henley, help me. Police waited a few days after Henley received the letter and then went to visit her at Cookham Wood, Kent, where she was being held. Henley agreed to identify certain areas where she and Brady visited, but she refused to admit to the murder of any further children. Henley stated that some spots were not identifiable unless she visited them. Against their better judgment, Superintendent Topping went to Home Secretary Douglas Hurd to get special permission for the convicted murderer to visit the Moors and possibly find other remains. Secretary Hurd weighed the pros and cons and determined that if this visit to the Moors with a convicted killer provided closure to those victims still not confirmed, it would be worth it. On the 16th of December, 1986, Henley made the first of two visits to the killing grounds of the Moors. The visit proved to be a waste of time. David Smith, by this time 38 years old, assisted the police in searching additional areas where remains could possibly be found. On February 10, 1987, Myra Henley confessed to her involvement in all five murders, although the information would not be released to the public for one month. Superintendent Topping did not fully believe the confession because he said Henley only gave enough information as she wanted the authorities to know. When Superintendent Topping informed Brady of Henley's confession, Brady refused to believe it until authorities gave him some of the details only the killers would know. Brady stated he was ready to confess also, but he wanted the authorities to give him materials for him to commit suicide. Of course, 
By law, authorities refused this absurd request. Winnie Johnson wrote another letter to Henley, even though she did not respond to the first letter. With all the negative publicity surrounding her first venture to the Moors, Johnson pled with Henley again to help find the remains of her son, Keith Bennett. As a result of the plea, Henley visited the Moors again and identified two locations where Bennett may have been buried, Holland Brown Knoll and Ho Grain. And although she could not identify the exact spot where the graves may be located, she did recognize a patch of grass on which she sat near where they may have buried Pauline Reed. With Henley's confession and her willingness to help police, cries for her release began to be heard throughout England. On July 1, 1987, authorities found the decomposed body of Pauline Reed three feet below the surface and approximately 100 yards from where authorities discovered the remains of John Kilbride. Upon the discovery of Reed's remains, Brady confessed to Superintendent Topping and further stated that he would help police in any further searches. Authorities escorted Brady to the moors for him to identify any grave sites, but he claimed to lose his bearing due to the changes in the landscape since he was last there. When Brady was allowed to go to the moors a second time, he identified a spot where Bennett's body could be found. After digging, the authorities found nothing. Although the two convicted murderers admitted to the Reed and Bennett murders, the Director of Public Prosecution saw no further satisfaction could be gained by prosecuting Henley and Brady further. Further attempts to locate Bennett's body in the 21st century failed. Following his conviction, Ian Brady spent 19 years in Durham prison until he was diagnosed as a psychopath and then sent to the high security Park Lane Hospital, now Ashworth Psychiatric Hospital in Sefton. Brady never cooperated with the staff physicians at the institution and after he broke his wrist in what he called a fight with staff members, Brady went on a hunger strike where authorities had to force feed him. Brady complained that all he wanted to do is die and he wasn't even being allowed to do that. Brady finally died on May 15, 2017 from what doctors termed restrictive pulmonary disease at Ashworth Hospital. Myra Henley filed an appeal to her convictions immediately after the trial. Brady and Henley corresponded by mail until 1971 when Henley ended the relationship. Henley fell in love with one of her prison warders, a Patricia Carnes. This, according to authorities, was not unusual as most of the warders at the prison where Henley stood incarcerated were gay and involved in relationships with other women or each other. Henley successfully changed her status from a Category A prisoner to a Category B prisoner, which allowed her greater freedom in and around the prison. The action caused a national outrage and the Home Secretary reprimanded the warden of the prison, Governor Dorothy Wing, who stated that this, quote, was part of her unofficial policy of reintroducing her charges to the outside world when she felt they were ready." End quote. After this incident, Henley, with the help of her lover Carnes, and another former inmate on the outside, planned an escape from the prison. An off-duty policeman discovered the plan when he found a set of duplicate keys to the inside doors of the prison. As a result of the plan, the court brought charges and once found guilty, Henley received an additional six years to her sentence. In 1982, the court determined that Henley would not be eligible for parole for 25 years. The court then increased this to 30 years until her eligibility could be redeemed. Mrs. Bennett, mother of victim Keith Bennett, held firm in a campaign to keep Henley in prison until the mother's death in 1999. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher stated in February 1985 that she believed that the sentences for Henley and Brady were too short and that, quote, I do not think that either of these prisoners should ever be released from custody, end quote. In July 1990, Henley stated that she was more involved in the murders for which she stood convicted than she first admitted. Therefore, then Home Secretary David Waddington, quote, imposed a whole life tariff on the inmate, end quote. News of this change reached Henley in 1994. In 1996, the parole board submitted a recommendation that Henley be moved to, quote, an open prison, end quote. Henley rejected this option, but was later moved to a minimum security prison at High Point. Between 1997 and 2000, 
Hinley protested against her whole life tariff, stating that she was a reformed woman and, quote, no longer a danger to society, end quote. The court rejected each appeal. On November 25, 2002, Hinley died from bronchial pneumonia at West Suffolk Hospital. A heavy smoker, Hinley had been diagnosed with angina in 1999 and hospitalized after suffering a brain aneurysm. Because the effects on the population of the murders and their animus toward Hinley and Brady, 20 undertakers in the area refused to cremate her body. Four months later, Karn spread her former lover's ashes in Staley Bridge Country Park. The population of Manchester became reviled at David Smith for earning money for his storytelling that led to the capture and prosecution of Myra Henley and Ian Brady. His wife, Maureen, eight months pregnant, was attacked in the elevator of the building where they lived. The couple received hate mail, and Maureen stated that she could not let her children out of her sight. In 1969, Smith was sentenced to three years in prison after stabbing a man in a fight Smith stated that the abuse was the reason for the fight. Upon his release, Smith moved in with a 15-year-old girl who subsequently became his second wife. Maureen finally divorced Smith in 1973 and later married a truck driver with whom she had another child. Maureen later died from a brain hemorrhage. In 1972, Smith was acquitted of the murder of his father and later married again and had three sons. Because of Hindley's most recent confession, Smith was exonerated of the Moore murders. In 1987, the Manchester City Council voted to demolish the house in which Myra Hindley and Ian Brady once lived, saying that it was a stain on their community. Until next time. If you enjoyed our presentation of True Crime, Please like, subscribe, and hit the bell to receive notifications on any future programs.